Last week's poem was a total bust. I changed a line to a uh, changed a line, and it turned to dust. But this week's poem is shiny and new, and unlike jihadis, it doesn't blame the Jew. Welcome back to this week in jihad, where we dare to say, "Hey, that's not for God." Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here with the illustrious, the great, the one, the only, the master of disaster. Dr. David Wood. David, welcome and good evening. Good morning. Yeah, I see you trying to make up for last last week's travesty. <laughs> Satan inspired that poem. And so I had to abrogate it. A Alfred lot Lord, threw it out. Alfred Lord Tennyson is rolling over in his grave last week. Did Alfred Lord Tennyson exist? <laughs> anyway... I had Allah abrogated it and gave me one just as good or better. And so we're good. Anyway, no more satanic poems. That was the only one that we're going to have inspired by Satan. Now, anyway, can you imagine the, 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 the uh, Dawagandists tomorrow? You see? He said he was inspired by Satan. <laughs> Isn't, 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 that, isn't that amazing, though? I mean, for anyone who's new to any of this, Muhammad walked out one day, delivered a revelation to his followers, saying they could pray to three pagan goddesses. His followers, he bowed down in honor of his new revelation. His followers bowed down, and then the pagans bowed down, too, because they said, hey, Muhammad's now praising and honoring our goddesses. Then later he comes back and says, oops, the devil made me do it. That's which, it, mean, man. Which, which means he he could not tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Gee. It's like if if I knew nothing about Muhammad except that one fact, that would be enough to say this is the last person in the universe I would ever take seriously on matters of religion, and that was that was nothing compared to <laughs> compared to what would follow for him. That's right, <laughs> wild stuff. Yes, it's great, and there's so many of his followers who have been busy emulating him as they are commanded to do in the Quran. And so we can get right to it, David. We had a very busy group of Muslim migrants from Syria in Austria at the uh, in Vienna, I believe. Uh, hard to tell here. But they were uh, there was a young couple they were walking to a bus stop in the 14th district, I believe that's Vienna, near Hütteldorferstrasse. Hütter, Hütteldorferstrasse, ja? Und ja. there was a Syrian and, and he was following them, ja? And they changed direction, but he kept coming. They began to, he began to whistle at them. And they asked him, why are you whistling? And then he began to try to stab them. There were four knife attacks in 48 hours, all done by Syrian Muslim migrants in Austria this past, in these past few days. And so, uh, that, why do you think there would be so many knife attacks by Muslim migrants? They must, how could they all be misunderstanding this peaceful religion in this way? Well, if I were to look at this from the perspective of government officials and journalists, I would say that perhaps there was a culture shock at seeing the the tiny sausages for which the city was named. And then <laughs> they just can't take it. They just can't take it. And they go on a, they go on a stabbing spree. Ah, there's sausages everywhere. You're trying to tempt us with these little sausages. And then uh, then you get a stabbing spree. So it's really it's really the, the fault of the uh, the Austrians. Yes, their, their Islamophobia leads them to continue to eat pork in the presence of Muslims. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what, so what do they expect? Here's an interesting story out of Germany, right next door to Austria. But not to be confused, do you know that there's actually a law now after Hitler that Germany and Austria cannot unite, no matter how much they might want to. They can't, because they tried that once and it didn't work out well for anybody. And that's good. That's fine with me, because I don't like either one of them. 
You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Um, anyway, in Duisburg, uh, there was a stabbing spree, one another stabbing spree, and this was another Syrian migrant. And he uh, stabbed four people in a gym. I believe I mentioned this on an earlier show. Now, David, the interesting thing about this is that uh, after he was arrested, the cops went to his apartment. Uh, the Gestapo went to his apartment. Yeah. Uh, no, I know there's no Gestapo now. It's all they're, they're all a free country now. Uh, and they found explosives. Actually, they found material about how to put explosives together, as well as how to construct poison gas. And they also found notes in which this gentleman had actually written out passages of the Quran by hand. And the passages of the Quran had to do with unbelievers. So he must have been reading all about and writing down passages all about how unbelievers should be given love and, and understanding and tolerance, right? Yeah, that's basically the entire Quran, Robert. Come on. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, you're being sarcastic, but I remember years ago there was some some uh, news news story going on about uh, Islam and and some terrorist attack or other, and so of course there's the imam there on the on 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 CNN or whatever it was to explain it all away, and this the host actually said. So is there some passage of the Quran that some Muslims misunderstand to mean that they should do violence? And a single passage, she was asking. And he said, uh, yeah, you know, there, there might be some passages that people misunderstand. But uh, the idea that the unbeliever had, that the infidel news host had that there was just one problematic issue in the Quran and the rest of it is all peace and love I expect that that's what a lot of non-Muslims in the West do assume yeah and, and ju just just imagine if these journalists they, they could do kind of the same thing but be somewhat accurate and make the conversation actually somewhat beneficial to society. Notice you could do the exact same thing and say, uh, so obviously people are reading passages of the Quran, like Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah. And they assume that Allah actually means what he says. He actually means fight those who do not believe in Allah. But we know that that's not what Allah really means. So could you explain to everyone how you conclude when Allah means the opposite of what he actually <laughs> says in the Quran? Could you explain that for us? And then you're still giving the Imam time to, you know, say, oh, what, what Allah really means when he says fight those who do not believe is fight people who are attacking you, but only in, in you know, if it's, if it's your last resort and it's a matter of, of pure self-defense. That's what he really meant. So, but people would actually be informed on what's going on in the mind of the jihadis while still allowing the imam to sugarcoat everything. So, I, I mean, just, just imagine, you, you wouldn't need to know much. You'd need to know a couple of the verses that are in the minds of jihadis to actually ask about them and and have some level of information in your, in your video that isn't just complete nonsense. David, if I were CNN, I'd hire you. Imagine, imagine, Robert... You've seen the you've seen the you've seen the plummeting numbers of CNN for many many years. Uh, yes. Just imagine just imagine if CNN decided, hey, we're going to quit. We're, we're going to stop defending these terrorist attacks. We're going to stop protecting the most obvious false prophet in history. Where 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 you know what? We're announcing our new show here on CNN. David Wood and Robert Spencer this week in Jihad, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I accept. I'll do it. I was in CNN. I was on CNN a few times back in the old days before they really froze out anything but their own perspective. And uh, the best thing actually that ever happened to me, maybe ever, happened in the CNN studios when I was standing around waiting to go on, waiting actually to go into the studio and 
get mic'd up and all that. And this elevator door opened, and there was Mike Ditka standing there. The Seriously. former head coach of the Chicago yeah. Bears. Yeah. And I was sort of taken aback. I was surprised. I hadn't really expected that. So I said a very intelligent thing. I said, hey, you're Mike Ditka. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And Mike Ditka said, you're that guy. And then the elevator doors closed. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> anyway, nothing to do with jihad. So, uh, okay, all, all, yes. All, all, although, I mean, Ditka was the uh, coach of the 1985 Chicago Bears. That's when they had, uh, of course, uh, McMahon and Refrigerator Perry, Walter Payton, Samurai Mike. Uh, they had a pretty, they had a pretty good, they had a pretty good squad. They won the Super Bowl that year. Just like we're going to win this Super Bowl against Jihad. See, I tied it together. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. You know, while we're on football, I could t- also tell you that Lawrence Taylor almost killed me once. Uh, mm-hmm. New York New York Giants player, right? And yeah. way back when I was in college, I was working all night in a, uh, in a convenience store. And he walked in and put a six-pack of beer on the counter. And I did what the rules were. May I see your ID, please, sir? Because they would fine you five hundred dollars if you mm-hmm. did not ask for the ID. And Lawrence Taylor, man, he had a fit. He was so angry, and he uh, he called me every other thing, and he paced up and down. And then he left, and I thought it was the end of it. And then he came back later with his ID, pushed it over in the at, at, at my face across the counter, and I saw, oh, Lawrence Taylor. Oh, I should have known. And he bought his beer. But anyway, he did not kill me. So we are still did you, having this show. Did you at least get his autograph? I did not. Uh, so it's it's his word against mine, I'm afraid. Greatest but, outside linebacker in history, and you don't get his... Okay. All right. I didn't, I didn't how, know this who is, he was. This is, how thing, this is how things work in Robert Spencer Land. He meets Iron Mike. He meets, uh, <laughs> meets Lauren LT. LT, Iron Mike. Yeah, I met all these guys. Yeah, I didn't know who he was. But uh, he knows it happened. If he's listening tonight, Lawrence, you know, you remember that midday probably because you were probably he's probably still get mad about it. Anyway, uh, let's go to France. And in France, uh, we had a story last Friday, David. Uh, we talked about this guy who painted uh, Allahu Akbar and Islam is uh, the way or something like that. I forget the other one, but Allahu Akbar certainly on the wall of a church. Now he also this turned out that he had a very busy evening. That not only did he do that, but he then went off and set fire to a gas station, and then went from the gas station to a bus station and set fire to ten buses. And when he was arrested. He said that he had been planning to set a fire in the local forest. And so he was on a very busy jihad night. The graffiti was just the beginning. And this also is yet another one of those who was invited into France recently as refugees. Yeah, actually, I have it here. Yeah, he, he painted Allahu Akbar, no God but Allah. And long live Islam and peace on the uh, church wall. I thought we talked about that last Friday, but maybe not. Anyway, this is all one guy's big jihad spree. Well, uh, they sure know how to pick them. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes, the French were told that if they, uh, as all the Europeans were told, if they open the doors to mass Muslim migration... It would make up for their aging pop- native population. They would form a workforce and do the jobs that the Europeans didn't want to do or got to be too old to do. And instead, many of the new arrivals have gone on welfare, have not been uh, taking the jobs at all, and are just another burden on the uh, system, the already overburdened welfare systems of those countries. Yesterday, I read a, uh, I read a questionnaire from John Wayne Gacy. You remember him? Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, 
serial killer uh strangled stabbed uh and uh raped the like 33 young men uh but uh reporters who wanted to come interview him before he was executed he would send them he would send them a questionnaire and you had to fill out this two page questionnaire so he would decide if he wanted to uh let you come interview him and it's things like you know uh what's your favorite food and what's your favorite this and what's that and it's like all those weird questions like what's this guy asking all this stuff about uh uh but he's like filtering people who are going to cast him in a in a positive light anyway i was just thinking as you were mentioning that story that like it seems like they have some sort of questionnaire for for the for migrants it's like do you want to burn everything you see to the ground (laughs) do you want to rape everything that is not wearing a full burqa uh do you want to because it seems like they're i mean it seems like that's like who they pick apparently Mm -hmm. it's a good idea there should be such a questionnaire do you know that uh i don't know if this is still true but it used to be true right after 9 11 there was actually a form that people wanting to enter the United States had to fill out. And it said, are you a member of a terrorist group? And you would say yes or no. And then there was a little asterisk and it said, please note, if you answer yes, this will not necessarily prevent you from being able to enter the United States. No, sweet. (laughs) Seriously. I, I don't know what insanity has overtaken these people, but. Isn't that funny though? Because because again, this would be really this would be really easy to do. You you hook the people up to a lie detector for a couple minutes, and then you ask some of these questions. Because mm-hmm. guess what? If he's if, if someone mm-hmm. is a member of a terrorist organization who's infiltrating your country for that terrorist organization, chances are they're okay with lying to you. I mean, ch- chances are. And uh, you know the 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 lie detector would would not be airtight, would not be foolproof, but it would be it would. Be, it would give you a little bit of an advantage in in asking this. You'd catch some people who are lying. Um, I wonder, you know, seriously, because doesn't the lie detector test work on the basis of um, some kind of like blood pressure or something like that, and, and it supposedly leaps or 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 there's a reaction, physic a physical reaction yeah, when you, you lie. Yeah, people. Yeah, people, yeah, when you lie, it, it affects your body differently from when you're telling the truth. And so they, they're detecting that. Well, you know, you remember, I, I think I met you in Nabil first time years ago, 100 years ago, when... It was Rifka Berry. Exactly. Was at the Rifka Berry round. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was another, there was a court hearing for Rifka Berry in Florida. And uh, we went and there were all these reporters there you know, big wall of reporters. And they actually were standing there filming while I was explaining about the death penalty for apostasy and citing Bukhari and various other sources. And this local Muslim guy in South Florida, or I guess it was Tampa, right? Uh, I forget where she went. Maybe it was South Florida. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He actually leapt into the camera range and started saying he's lying what he's saying it is not true uh allah does not say anything about apostasy and muhammad is tolerant and peace and i looked at his eyes i was trying to see if it was if was there's gonna be the slightest flinch because i knew that everything he was saying was a flat out lie but he was saying it with such conviction such evident sincerity that I bet he would have been able to pass a lie detector test. You know, when you think war is deceit and that Allah has given you this mandate to deceive the unbelievers when you're under pressure in various ways, maybe you don't feel that physical reaction. Um, yeah, that's true. They, they do tend to work pretty well, though. They're, they're, the reason they're not allowed in court is that they're, they're not 100%, and you don't want to convict someone based on, you know, some mm. weird flaw. But... Uh, they're they're pretty reliable which is which i i'd settle for if you're asking questions of some uh some jihadis um but yeah like psychopaths are apparently good at uh good at beating them because they have no they have no problem with lying right Mm -hmm. (laughs) they can just lie and they don't care so anyway um but yeah uh anyway something 
something would help. Um, yes. Rather than rather than the rather than the are you a member of a terrorist group? Check, <laughs> if if you are, check this box. Yeah, you know, this this is not a joke. This is a real thing. Uh, I couldn't believe it, but uh, Congressman Tom Tancredo, former congressman from Colorado, ran for president in 2008. He told me this. He just couldn't believe it when he dis he actually saw this form. And uh, I actually saw it later, too, as I recall. But in any case, it's, 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 it's incredible, but there it was. Okay, let me see if this works. Nope, doesn't work. Okay, let me try it another way. Um, the next story, David, comes out of Florida. This young gentleman, can you see him there? Looks like Opie Taylor. Well, that's Opie Taylor from hell. Uh, that is Devin Arthurs, and he converted to Islam a few years ago. He was actually a neo-Nazi, and he was in a little neo-Nazi group in Florida that called themselves the Atom Waffen Division, that is the uh, Nuclear Weapons Division. And a couple of his roommates were in it as well, uh, Jeremy Himmelman and Andrew Onseschuk. And after a while, though, I don't know, maybe he got tired of all the Heil Hitlering and all the silly nonsense that they were doing. And so he was looking for something else, but he did not go far. He, he converted to Islam. And so Himmelman and Onseschuk, what do you think they did, David? They began to make fun of him. They began not only to make fun of him, they began to mock his new religion. Well, that's kind of Islamophobic. Yes, indeed. And so what he did was he got a gun and he murdered both of them. And he explained that he had, he said, I had to do it. This would not have had to happen if your country didn't bomb my country. Now, Devin Arthurs is, is an American. So what did he mean by if your country didn't bomb my country? Um, yeah, so something in the Middle East, which is now his country now? Yeah, he's part of the global ummah, the Islamic community worldwide. So his nationality is superseded. He is a Muslim before anything. And he also said that he wanted to do it to call attention to the dangers of anti-Muslim sentiment. Yeah, well, it's did a bang up job there. Yes, I, 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 I had. It's interesting. I have heard over the past several months. I have heard about people who are neo Nazis or at least with those sympathies converting to Islam, wondering why, of course, and maybe it's just the Maybe they're actually looking into the history of the Nazis and seeing what, what great buddies they were with, uh, you know, with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and stuff like this. And maybe they're looking into that or maybe it's just maybe it's just they hate, you know, they're on the same page when it comes to hating Jews. And they think, hey, there aren't a lot of neo-Nazis, but if I really want to target Jews and there's this much bigger group out there that I could be part of. Yep. This is another picture of Devin Arthurs. This is when he pleaded guilty just a few days ago, to the hey, two murders. Pleaded guilty to what? Being a dork? <laughs> Classic. <laughs> guilty. He pleaded guilty, guilty as charged. to the two murders. He got 45 years in prison for two murders, which I think is a bit uh, lax, but whatever. And he s apologized. He said that he wanted to be a uh, witness against extremism now. Right. But wow, do you see job. this picture here, David? And it seems to me that he's still got the Islam going because he's got the shaved upper lip and the beard. And mm -hmm. so my, I yeah. just, I don't know how is an extremist he's going to end up being. Yeah, as uh, as he's following the commands of Muhammad. Muhammad had Muhammad had his followers on this grooming schedule of how frequently they needed to pluck their armpit hairs and their pubic hairs and their hairs on their lips and so on which anyone else in history would recognize as like obsessive compulsive with some weird <laughs> with some weird fetishes going on 
But if you bring this up to Muslims, like, hey, why is your why is your why is your uh, prophet obsessed with you plucking your pubic hairs and your armpit hairs and uh, how you pee? And why does he say that, you know, over half the punishment of the grave is for urinating improperly because you don't squat to pee like a girl? It's like, why is your <laughs> Why is your why is your prophet obsessed with all this stuff? And they're like, oh, he, because because he's pro hygiene. And it's like. No, I mean, this is the same guy that said you could use water with dead animals floating in it to perform your ablutions. Matter of fact, the well of Buddha, that was uh, that had used menstrual. That's where they dumped their their uh, toilet buckets, their menstrual cloths, and they threw dead animals in there. It was not it was not considered water to use. It was a it was a dump. And Muhammad said, uh, yeah, you can use that for your ablutions. So this is not about hygiene. This is the guy who walked around covered in semen. Aisha would say she would always have to scrub it off when he's walking out to the mosque. Then he goes to the mosque and hugs it out with all his buddies uh, after he's, you know, Aisha scraped some of the semen off. Anyway, the point is, this has nothing to do with hygiene. The dude's just obsessed. <laughs> dude's just obsessed with with how you groom yourself and stuff like this. It's probably connected to the grooming gang since it's all grooming. Anyway, I don't know. Weird stuff. Weird, creepy stuff in this religion. Yes. No doubt about that. Okay. Uh, Nigeria. Always a hotbed. Yep. We have uh, a, a worship service going on last Sunday morning at uh, the Beje Baptist Church on Baruku Baringi Road, David, if you want to go to it. It's in the Chikun local government area of Kaduna State. And the jihadis came in. The worshipers were in the middle of the Sunday service. About 9.30 in the morning, the jihadis opened fire outside the church, and then they came in. They didn't kill anyone this time, though, but they stormed the place, and they carried off 40 of the Christians. Now, what is the kidnapping all about? Um, well, you, I mean, that, that's been built into Islam mm -hmm. for, a, for a really long time, the taking, the taking captives. Um, you can, of course, you can, of course, take them, make them your slaves. You can sell them. You can trade them. Uh, the women, you can rape them. Um, and from an Islamic perspective, why wouldn't you? God is saying that he actually likes it when you go out and kidnap and rape these uh, unbelieving women and so on. That's a very important point because a lot of people don't realize it's not just that these things are given permission but when Allah says, you know, you can have four wives and the captives of the right hand and the captives of the white right hand are women taken in war and used as sex slaves, then that's something that 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 is a, obeying and fulfilling an express command of Allah. And so it's kind of sacramental in a certain sense. It's a devotional act to commit this rape. And this is something that some of the victims of the rape gangs actually said explicitly that the the rapists would read Quran or pray and tell them that they what they were doing was a kind of prayer to Allah and so on. I've got all the quotes and links at Jihad Watch. It's, uh, it's hard for Westerners to believe, but there it is. And yet, if you tell them, you're the bad guy. Not the people who are doing it. They're okay. You're the bad guy for telling people about it. Indeed. Uh, since we're in the United States dealing with Devin Arthurs, uh, I should have done this one right after. This is a guy in Virginia from Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, where I once uh, attended public school way back in the early 70s, long before you were born, David. Muhammad Azharuddin Chipa in Fairfax County, Virginia was fi was uh, wiring money over to Islamic State women in the al Hol refugee camp, which is interesting because the al Hol refugee camp is where uh, Shamima Begum, the famous ISIS bride in Britain, what from Britain, uh, lived for a while. I don't think she lives there now, but in any case, uh, it's a hotbed of jihad activity. And these Islamic State women that he was sending the money to were very much part of the jihadist activity in this camp. Um, he sent them at least $18,000. But since he took, uh, he purchased 
187000 in digital currency altogether, it's very likely that he sent them much more than just the eighteen grand. And he said that he uh, realized, he said, I realize I only have three or four destinations in life, including Hydra or Jihad. And his home computer had thousands of videos, pictures, essays, books, notes, and search histories about Jihad and ISIS. Of course, so does mine. But anyway, the <laughs> I haven't been sending money to ISIS girls in uh, Syria. Yeah, that's... um. I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you've seen that these. Uh, you've got these uh, ISIS jihadi women in these refugee camps, and have you seen this? Where they're having like the twelve and thirteen and fourteen year old boys. They're making the twelve and thirteen and fourteen year old boys have sex with them because they're trying to produce. They're trying to make babies mm -hmm. to be the next the the next generation of jihadis. It's interesting how like their thinking is long term, right? They, they have this long term thinking. It's like, hey, they joined ISIS because that's what they want. They want this Islamic caliphate. They lost. They're in a refugee camp. And so what do they do? What do you do? Do you give up and say, oh, OK, this didn't work out. Uh, Allah isn't really supporting this. Uh, we need to shut it down or we just didn't try hard enough. We need to start. And you got these grown women you know, 25, 30, 35 years old, having sex with 12, 13, 14 year old boys just to get pregnant uh, so that they can, you know, so that 15, 16, 18 years from now, they've got the next generation of jihadis. And then you also have people who aren't involved in the actual jihad, except for supporting it financially. Why is this guy support it? You know, sending this money to these brides who are <clears throat> plotting the next generation of jihadis he's sending the money right here's to support here's to support you and your kids as you raise them for jihad it's very very long-term thinking compared to the, the rest of the world well this is a very important point also david because of course you're talking about people who they believe they're waging a 1400 year old struggle they think that they inherited this from their fathers they will pass it on to their children and grandchildren and it's just going to keep going Whereas in the United States, people think, oh, jihad? Yeah, that was 2003. Now it's all over. And they have no idea of what's going on or what is likely to come in the future. From Iran, from the Islamic Republic of Iran, David, on Monday, they executed two people for desecrating the Quran and insulting Muhammad. Wait, now, I, do those th I do those things all the time. Well, if you go to Tehran, you might get executed. So I would cancel oh. your vacation plans. That's weird. They're, so they're executing people for stuff I do pretty regularly. Yeah. Interesting. And yet, if I... So let me get this straight, Robert. Let me, let me get this straight. Wherever this ideology takes hold, people like me and like you and like most of my friends all get slaughtered. Get, we, they all get mm -hmm. executed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I don't know. Am I allowed to oppose that or not? Because this no. is something it's it, yeah, it, it's spreading and it calls for my death, uh, possibly the death of my wife, but they might just take her as a, a as a as a sex slave. Um, and and the 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 brutal executions of most of my friends. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying I'm not allowed to stand in the way of that in any way or, or, or that would make me a, a racist and a bigot. Right. Yeah. That would be Islamophobic. Okay. okay, not wanting to not wanting to die, not wanting my family to be enslaved, not wanting my friends to be brutally murdered, that's wrong. Okay. Yeah. I got, I got, the, yeah. I got the rules. Actually, I'm going to skip ahead here to the stupid infidels because uh, the White House, actually, the uh, second gentleman, uh, They. this is a new thing. He's the very first second gentleman douglas m hoff the husband of kamala harris the vice president of the united states he hosted a meeting at the white house this past week and it was a listening session on islamophobia and there were all manner of people there from the council on american islamic relations were the you islamic there? society of north america i was not oddly enough they didn't I wasn't invite invited. You. They didn't... 
They, no. Me neither. What is up with that? Anyway, I don't know what's going on. You know what's weird, David, is that not a single one of the people who was invited represented any point of view other than that of care and isna that is it was all people who say oh islamophobia is this terrible problem there wasn't a single person there who would have said what you just said that all your friends and family and you yourself would be killed just for criticizing this ideology and yet nobody was there to say wait a minute if that's what islamophobia means then everybody should be islamophobic isn't that, I mean, isn't that interesting? If you, if you were, if you're with like the Council on American Islamic Relations, suppose hypothetically, now we know what goes on. We've heard what goes on behind the scenes of that organization and what the real agenda is. And you could see it. If you look, if you look, you can see what the real agenda of that group is. But suppose hypothetically you had someone there who actually believes what, what they say in public. Uh, suppose they actually believe that it's, it's all peaceful and, uh, anyone who says otherwise is just completely misreading the Quran and the Muslim sources and so on. Wouldn't you want the opportunity to expose people like, I mean, wouldn't you say, hey guys, look, look, if we're doing this big thing, this big event. Let's get Robert Spencer and all these other guys. Let's get them in here. Let's get them on stage. Let's say, okay, Robert, what verses are you misquoting and distorting? Go ahead and tell us your verses and we'll discuss it. We'll all get in this big discussion right now and see if we can get to the bottom of this so that so that people realize that they can't trust you because you're the one who's misrepresenting the sources. Instead, we're the ones always offering discussions like that and they want nothing to do with it. They have to so completely marginalize everyone who disagrees with them um that the, the other person can never be so much as allowed to to speak and that is very odd if you think the 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 evidence is decisively in your favor mm -hmm. yeah well they want us to all think that the evidence is decisively in their favor without ever bothering to prove it or either even to engage the opposition reminds you know when you were just saying that it reminds me of uh it's been about eight years now the bbc was having a discussion about uh Pamela Geller and I being banned from Britain. And I happened to be sleepless that night, as sometimes happens. And so about three in the morning, I saw them say, them announce it on Twitter. And so I tweeted back at them, how can you have a discussion about Pamela Geller and me without having either of us on the show? And so they were kind of shamed into having me on the show. It was 5 a.m. and I hadn't slept and I'm on this show. And they... But you're, let, let me guess, you were still in your suit though. Well, of course. Uh, and... <laughs> these are my these are my PJs. <laughs> and the uh, they they had an imam, and so the host says, "Well, so what's your problem, Spencer? What what do you have a problem with in the Quran?" And uh, so I reeled off some of the usual verses. Whoa, that's pretty uh, powerful. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, yeah, well, you can. It's still out there on YouTube, I think. Um, they took it down once it had half a million views, but they took it down. But I think somebody put it back anyway. So I reel off some of the verses, you know, kill them wherever you find them, beat your wife, this and that. And they say, the host says, okay, Imam, what do you have to say to all that? And the Imam says, I don't have anything to say to all that. That's, that's his field. And the guy yeah. says, wait a minute, you're, a, you're an imam. He's, this is the Quran. And he said, I'm not here to talk about that. I, I, I'm here to talk about why he should be banned from Britain. He did not offer the slightest. He didn't even say it's all out of context and it's all uh, 7th century. It's all made up, whatever, misquoted. He didn't even offer the usual. He just he said, that's his that's my field. The Quran. And, <laughs> and that and that is. That is why they they can't have a public discussion about this. It, they just they just can't do it, yes. um, and because the the goal is to keep people. I, I've I've pointed this out before that it was like this with Muslim apologists, the Da'is. They understood if you go back to the time of Zakir Naik and uh, and Ahmed Didat, almost all of the, Didat's debates were on Christian topics. He understood don't put Islam up for discussion because then people are going to criticize Muhammad and the Quran and the audience knows nothing about Islam. So all, all I want the audience to hear as Ahmed Didat is 
criticisms of Christianity, no criticisms of Islam, because if we even discuss the problems with Islam, then people are going to know about the issues. Mm -hmm. um, so you've had you had that. But now, you know, t we're, we're only, you know, 20, 30 years later after some of this stuff. Um, now you've got these guys defending child brides and uh, secret second wives and so on. They're defending all the stuff that uh, I, I even just recently shared a, a clip of Muhammad Hijab uh, scolding Muslims for not being aware of the textual variants in the different uh, the different ah. versions of the Quran, the different kirat. It's like, wait a minute, just a few years ago, you were one of the guys babbling about perfect preservation. Now you're telling Muslims they need to be aware of the differences. Anyway, point is, it takes a while for these things to start to become common knowledge, and that's when the Muslims have to start being honest about them or, or at least discussing them in public instead of hiding them. But I, I, I'm wondering if it's going to eventually get to a point like that in the media where if, if you have all these people who really think, oh, yeah, the Quran is really peaceful and there's just maybe one verse somewhere in there that someone's distorting and ripping out of context. Um, as more and more people find out about what's in there, it seems like they're, they're, they might actually get to the point where they say, OK, we have we, we have to discuss this stuff now. I would have thought that would have come like 20 years ago after 9-11 or after the 7-7 bombings or something like that, but apparently not. But uh, that was back in the stage where the general atmosphere was no one knew anything about Islam. And mm -hmm. that's slowly changing over time. So I don't know. I, I think it would be it would be awesome if we eventually sort of broke through this media blockade of any serious discussions of Muhammad, because uh, I think that would be the end of this of Islam. Yeah, I understand the point. It could well. There's never been anything like the Internet, never been anything like the international media in the history of Islam. It used to be you would grow up in Yemen or Saudi Arabia or Iran, and you would never hear any challenge. You would never come close to hearing any challenge to the idea that Islam is the absolute truth. And now you can just go online and find hundreds of challenges all every day. And so I don't know how they're going to deal with this just by calling the uh, challenge, the people issuing the challenges Islamophobic and all that nonsense. It's not going to work forever. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. We've got a, quite, a, quite a lot more to go here. Um, in F Italy, we have uh, another migrant from Morocco. And he was, according to the Italian paper, La Unione Sarda, he was throwing a tantrum and shouting in the middle of the street. What was he shouting, David? Come on, Robert. We all know it's Allahu Akbar, even though I've never seen the story you're referring to. That is correct, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so passersby were alarmed. A few years back, uh, CNN and a few others tried to convince people, don't get scared when people say Allahu Akbar. It's a beautiful affirmation of mm -hmm, devotion. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, most people know that it has to do with going jihad. And so people were getting scared. When the cops came, the carabinieri, they, he actually took a pistol off of one of them in the scuffle and started shooting and injured a traffic cop. And uh, in any case, that was just another day in Italy, in uh, Fara, Vin Vicent Fara Vicentino. I think I had that for dinner one night. Fara Vicentino. Yeah, it's very good. With the Bela Scalapini. Yes, and a nice Chianti. All right, uh, Bangladesh. A, uh, a Muslim woman, actually, went into two Hindu temples and uh, knocked off the heads of the Hindu idols, vandalized the temples, and so on. Uh, this is a very common kind of story, and ultimately the objective is to drive the Hind remaining Hindus out of Bangladesh altogether. Uh, David, why break the idols? Why not have respect and tolerance for the other, other people's religions? Yeah, that's what we always hear whenever someone, you know, 
burns a Quran or draws a cartoon of Muhammad or something like that, they say, oh, we respect the sacred symbols of other religions. Total lie. I mean, that an individual Muslim might respect uh, people's sacred symbols and so on. But as far as the religion goes, uh, when Muhammad uh, took control of Mecca, he, he went around the Kaaba. There were 360 idols around the Kaaba, and he went around there stabbing them with a stick and gouging their eyes out in order to show his contempt for them by degrading them. And uh, then, as you've pointed out, that, that didn't stop, especially when Muslims were taking uh, Hindu temples and so on. That was pretty standard practice was to smash their idols. And uh, sp even sprinkle them on the ground around the mosque so that they could walk, walk, trample on their their idols, and uh, yeah, so pretty, uh, pretty unsurprising that someone would say, "Oh, I need to do what Muhammad did." He's the pattern of yes, he's the pattern of conduct according to Islam. What did Muhammad do when he got when he uh, took over people's idols? He desecrated them, and so yeah, not surprised. Not at all. Okay, in next door to Bangladesh, in India, this is Sadhu Magar. Those are two photographs of Sadhu Magar, who is a Hindu, and he is the driver of an auto rickshaw. You can see his auto rickshaw in the left-hand side of the picture. He, uh, it's sort of a taxi, and he takes people around. And you see that on the back of it, he's got a poster, a movie poster, for the Kerala story, mm. which is a new movie that's just out that is about jihad recruitment among Muslim women in the Indian state of Kerala. And Sadhu Magar was actually offering people free rides in his auto rickshaw if they were going to see the Kerala story because he thinks it's an important movie and was uh, encouraging people to see it. And so uh, local Muslims in the area where he was working found out. And what do you think they did, David? Did they congratulate him on his commitment to tolerance and pluralism? Uh, yeah, something like that. I mean, you know, worst case scenario, they would probably would have uh, calmly stated their own views and then asked him to politely respond to their concerns. <laughs> they threatened to behead him. Oh, that too. Yes. <laughs> if plan if if plan A doesn't work, there's always that. There's always plan B. <laughs> All right. Uh, out of South Africa, we have a story. We don't often have stories out of South Africa, but this one has to do with. We've actually talked about this guy before, because I remember his name and how uh, kind of ludicrous it is. This is a convert to Islam, David, and he is on trial now for a jihad attack. And uh, hang on, I'm getting it here. His name is Saif, Saifuddin Aslam Delvecchio. And oh, Saifuddin, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a typo here. It's Saifuddin, that is sort of the religion, Saifuddin Aslam Del Vecchio. And he converted to Islam, obviously, and did not change his surname. In any case, uh, he is in on trial with his wife, Fatima Patel, and another convert to Islam, Ahmad Jackson. And Saifuddin Aslam Del Vecchio and Ahmad Jackson and Fatima Patel, they encountered two English botanists one of them was in his 70s and one of them in his 60s, in her 60s, his wife, Rodney Saunders, 73 years old, and his wife, Rachel, 63. And they were, they were botanists. They were looking for rare plants and seeds in South Africa. And he uh, killed them. And there is the, the state is now on trial and the state has revealed a WhatsApp communication between <clears throat> Saifuddin Aslam Del Vecchio, Fatima Patel and Ahmad Jackson to kill the Kufar, abduct their allies, destroy infrastructure and put fear in the heart of the Kufar. Huh. And this Weird is thoughts. why they said they kill, will kill this elderly couple 
to put fear in the heart of the Kufar. And they killed them and fed them to crocodiles in a river there in South Africa. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all, all of this stuff, I mean, especially like the, the grooming gangs in the UK, um, people act like, oh, you know, you can always have some weird person who has some weird view of a religion. True. You, you can always have some weirdo who interprets things uh, based on his own mental problems and so on and completely gets things wrong. It's usually pretty hard for that person to win over a lot of support for his views when anyone who's reading the same text would go, dude, you're nuts. So you could come up with anyway. The, the point here is if I came out, if, if I came out to, to my friends tomorrow and I said, hey, 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 guys, you know, uh, I was just reading. Uh, I was just reading the Sermon on the Mount and I've concluded that Jesus really wants me to go brutally murder some botanists and destroy the infrastructure and everything like <laughs> No one's gonna. No one's gonna be like, "Oh wow, that wow, you're right. Let's go do it." Right? You're not gonna win a lot of support. And the same thing with like the the grooming gags. If you ever notice, it would be like when it when it would give the list of like the the twenty guys who are on trial for raping these girls and stuff. It would be like fathers and sons and brothers and cousins. It's like this big family affair. And I, I was just thinking about if I if I went to my brothers and I said, "Hey, let's go let's go gang rape a twelve year old." There would be some there would be some brief amount of time where they try to figure out if I'm serious or joking. If they discover that I'm serious, someone's getting clocked right there. Someone's get I'm someone's getting knocked out for even suggesting that. Uh, so that's that that's the idea. You can of course you can have you can have people who have weird views and misinterpret things and so on. Um, why is it that so many people instantly are on the exact same page when it comes to jihad? If it's just a misunderstanding of some weirdo. Why, as soon as ISIS goes, hey, uh, we're starting the caliphate, you get this flood of tens of thousands of people from all over the world who somehow magically had the exact same ideas about how they're supposed to live. Weird that all of this is just this, this mass misunderstanding. It is. It's astonishing. And meanwhile, we have the stupid infidels. I think we got to get some stupid infidels in here. We did have the White House meeting already, but... Uh, before we go, a few more stupid infidels. Sweden, always a goldmine for stupid infidels, David. They have arrested the Quran burner, Rasmus Paladon. The only problem is, David, he ain't there. He's been arrested in absentia. <laughs> and so what this essentially means is that if he sets foot in Sweden again, he will be arrested. But... I, it must be emphasized, Rasmus Paladon has not broken any laws. They actually do have a law protecting the freedom of expression in Sweden. And so he was just exercising that. If, if I, yeah, you, you know what I would do? See, What's here's that? the thing. People don't, under, people don't understand the power of, uh, of escalation. If I, were, if I were this Paladin dude, I would, uh, I would get 100 people, 100 people to all swear. <clears throat> if... Paladin is arrested upon returning to Sweden. We are all going to publicly burn copies of the Quran. A hundred of us. Therefore, if you, if, 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 if he doesn't get arrested, we're not going to do anything. And he will just go around as this lone Quran burner. But if you arrest him, a, a hundred of us are going to instantly take his place as, as publicly burning the Qurans and so on. And then I would have him just go right back to Sweden and say, all right, guys, I'm here. I'm here. Just keep in mind. Your actions are about to decide whether a bunch of Qurans get burned. Not mine. Not mine. Your actions. <laughs> your actions right now. Put some handcuffs on me. Qurans are getting burned, and you're responsible. Do not put those cuffs on me. Qurans don't get burned except except by me. So what do you want to do? Do you want to do you really want to escalate this? Watch out, watch how quickly those cowards back down. Probably so. Unfortunately, I don't know if he would he could get a hundred people with that much guts. I, I can help. I, I, I can help. I, I'll help him out there. <laughs> okay, Rasmus, you heard it here. Uh, contact me at director jihadwatch.org and we'll set it up. Just, just to clarify, everyone, as always, I think book burning is stupid and ridiculous. It's when you say uh, you can't do it and we're going to murder you over it. That's when I suddenly want to do it. Exactly. I would never have cared to draw a cartoon of Muhammad, except when they said, we're going to kill you if you draw a cartoon of Muhammad. Then it becomes a matter of standing up to violent intimidation yeah then if you if if, if they say we're going to kill you for doing this then if you don't if you don't do it then you just basically sent them a message saying hey anytime you want something just use violence as the as the uh 
as the uh, as the reason why we should just do whatever you want. And that's a mm-hmm. bad message to send. So you got you got to do the opposite. You got to do the opposite. Exactly. Okay, another one out of France. This is a great stupid infidel story, David. This is a man riding a bus. And at a certain point, he decided that he wanted to drive. So he demanded that he be allowed to drive. He tried to take the wheel from the driver. This caused the bus to crash. And uh, then this fellow fled and searches for him were conducted. Then the next day, there was a brush fire near a house where the bus had crashed and this guy that they were looking for comes out of the bushes next to the fire and he's got a knife and he's got an iron bar and what is he shouting david allahu akbar blah 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 except you know it's funny about that it's funny (laughs) you say that i don't know how you know these things but the bus was called i don't know what what this is in france but it's a bus, it's very clearly labeled, blah, blah, car. <laughs> and so it's as if somehow you knew that this was going to be the case. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you do it, David. Really, it's amazing. I've um, developed psychic, after you, you've, you've honed my psychic abilities, Robert, through. Yes, that's it. Through these episodes. Yep. I'm actually trying to get the picture, but it's not coming right up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, never mind. Okay. But it says very clearly, you can see the picture, Jihad Watch, blah, blah, car. Anyway, he, so he's shouting Allahu Akbar, and he is charging at the cops, and he gets arrested. And what do you think the French paper, La Provence, says at the end of the article? No idea. His motives are not known. Of course. (laughs) Now, see, this is this is a common one that we get because uh, he the French authorities cannot accept that there is anything such as a jihad, any such thing as a jihad. And consequently, they have to make up other excuses or just pretend it doesn't exist when it appears. There's the crashed bus that he caused. And you can see it right at the front, blah, blah, car, right there. The bus to Lyon, and uh, the brush fire was nearby here. In any case, it was very much a jihad attack, but the French don't admit that there is such a thing as a jihad attack. Consequently, they could not figure out why on earth he did it. Isn't it interesting? I mean, it's like, it's only with, it's only with this where the the motive is always somehow shrouded in mystery like no one says hey you know uh, that hitler guy we we still have no idea what he was thinking you know exactly what he was thinking he told you what he was thinking before he ever did any of this stuff he, he said what he was thinking right just like what the jihadis are thinking you've already you already know what the game plan is you've had it for 14 centuries you you know exactly why they're doing stuff and somehow when they do exactly what they're commanded to do oh it's just one of life's great mysteries why they did it Yep. Well, there's clearly a concerted effort to conceal this and to make people not know what they're all about. Now, what that what the purpose of that is? Well, that's a whole other hour. Anyway, ending up here, this gentleman, you can see him there. He is Ahmad El Hajj, and he applied for asylum in Denmark and was granted it and granted citizenship in Denmark. So there he is, a melancholy Dane, Ahmed El Hajj. And Ahmed El Hajj, after he was granted citizenship, he celebrated by making a a video in which he was shooting at various Danish people, such as the Prime Minister of Denmark, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, Kurt Vestergaard, the author of the most famous cartoon of Muhammad and others and he filmed this actually in syria because even though he had been named a danish citizen he was waging jihad for the islamic state in syria with his there is no god but allah headband and 
all of the jihadi gear. But uh, this was how he uh, showed his gratitude to the Danes by joining ISIS. And so uh, he was actually just now found guilty of treason. He just became a Danish citizen and immediately commits treason. You would think he may never have really cared to be loyal to Denmark at all. Yeah, if I didn't know better, which I don't, I would think he never intended to be loyal to Denmark at all. Yeah. Well, the Uma overrides all other loyalties, as we saw with the case of Devin Arthurs in Florida. So that brings us to another the conclusion of another thrilling hour of This Week in Jihad. And this has been just uh, half a week, actually, since we did the last show Friday, but always more jihad than we can get to. It just keeps coming. You can find the rest at jihadwatch.org. And keep yourselves careful. Care, uh, keep a careful eye out this week. God willing, we'll be here next week again to track more jihad. But you never know. Maybe all the misunderstanding will end. And this will be it. David, thank you. God bless. Have a great night.